they have got clean faces. There's no mud. Oh, I saw those two boys the other day and they'd been down playing in the mud and they had mud in their boots and mud all over their bikes and you could just see their eyes. Yeah. And it reminded me when I was a little boy because my mother said that I loved mud. Do you know what I used to like to do when I was a little boy? Make mud pies. Yeah, but they didn't taste any good. But I used to eat snails when I was a little boy. Yeah. Bit yucky, eh? Well, today's story. When I was a little boy, I went to school in the big city of Melbourne and there were 900 of us and there were teachers everywhere and it was a big school ground because all the big kids were on one side and we were on the other side and the big kids had built us up when we were going home. So they made a law. We were all let out half an hour earlier and we had to go straight for home and run and never look backwards. But then we went to the bush, way up near Brisbane in the bush, Mwoolumba, and we never went to school. We had to do correspondence. But then a little school opened up and we went to this school and the teacher was a footballer and he was very sports-minded. And he was going to have a football team in his school. He played rugby and he wanted to teach us. And he was a good footballer when he wasn't drunk. And anyway, he took us down to this big paddock, a farmer's paddock, down on the flats from the mountains where we lived. And he said, now I'm going to teach you to play football. Well, he taught us a few Fridays how to play football. And then... He decided to choose me as the right winger, the one who's the last one to get the ball and run for the line because I used to be, used to be able to run really fast. Yeah, for a couple of hundred yards. All right. And so I remember him pulling me over one day and he said, George... When we're passing the ball going up the field, we keep our eye on the one behind. But you, when you get the ball, never look back. Just go for it. Okay. Then, that's the first thing I learned. When you're running, never look what? Back. Why? What happens? Yeah, you can trip over and bang into someone. I heard about a boy last night that ran backwards and hit a pole and knocked himself out. Who was telling me that story? Must have been at your place. Anyway, then he said, well, we're going to have the annual sports and all the schools of the Northern Rivers from Lismore, Mullumbimby, Yelgin, you know, Tweed Heads. Everybody was coming to run. And we thought, oh, man, we don't want to go because those boys down there from the Solomon South Sea Islanders and they're like deers. They just go, Phew. we wouldn't even start. And the teacher said, well, you listen to me. And so he took us in to have a practice in the big town of Mwoolumba on this big oval and they'd put lines all around it. We had to run between the black lines. And we were running real fast, but I had a very bad habit. What was the bad habit? Yes, looking back to see what the next fellow was doing if he was getting too close. And I was running really fast and I could hear this fellow coming behind me. <laughs> and so I looked back and what happened to me? I tripped over and fell over and I didn't win. Lucky it was only a practice. I didn't win anyway. Not the race they put me in because they put me in with this big boy. He was about 12 and he was nearly six foot and he was as skinny, as skinny as my finger. And could he run? Phew, he could go. Anyway, the teacher pulled me aside after I'd fallen over. He's very kind really and he sat me on the, on the park bench and he said, George, you've got to learn something, my boy. When you're running, he said, you keep your eye on the end. Don't worry about anybody else. Don't worry what anybody else is doing. Just run and keep looking forward. And what he said worked because I listened, because I'd learnt the hard way, I fell over and I was very ashamed and embarrassed. And so ever afterward, I always used to say to myself, don't look back, whatever you're doing, don't look back. And... 
whenever I was teaching boys and girls as they were growing up, I'd say, when you run, don't look back. And my little grand boy, I say to him, when you run, don't look back because he had my gene. The first time I went to watch him, it was lucky he could run fast. He was along, but he kept looking back. I said, don't look back and you'll make better time. And so he doesn't look back anymore now. He keeps going. And do you know what I saw in the last Olympic Games? Do you know what I saw? I could not believe it. I could not believe it. A professional running like a deer, really going. And near the end of the line, looked back to look at the other fella. And what happened? The other fella went pew, straight past and won by that much because it takes energy to turn and you lose your strength. So when we're running, don't what? Look back. And when you're living for Jesus, don't look back to Satan or you'll trip. Okay? Have a happy day. And listen to the sermon and get a pencil, piece of paper and write down how many times I, times I say run and race. Okay? I'm reading this out of the New International Version. It says, Therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Amen. We put, the, we put this up one notch, do you mind? Good morning, everybody. It's good to be home. And don't be fooled, I say that in a lot of places I go to. But it's good to be home. It only seems like yesterday. You know, when you get out of the plane and start coming up the road, I felt I was coming home from committee, Les, and all the names of the places and the streets come back and the same trees are there. Some have gone. And uh, it feels like home. Good to be with you all this morning. Good to see all your shining faces and lovely to see the boys and girls growing up and to see lots of new people here that I never knew before. Glad to have you with us too. It's a little bit like heaven, isn't it? Because there's people here from every nation, kindred, tongue and people and that's what we're going to be when we get to heaven. And remember Pastor Pearson used to say, it doesn't matter where we come from, it's where we're going that counts. And that's why we shouldn't look back. Now, I bring you greetings from Galston and Thornley churches, from the church in Australia and your relatives that are around in lots of places. And I'm sure they'd like me to say hi to you today. Um, I don't have enough time today. I like to preach in series and build on the one behind and several weeks ago, I happened to go along to the doctor for a blood test. I go every 12 months to make sure that I'm still alive. And, uh, and she was elder in another church where my family goes. And she said, what are you preaching on tomorrow? And I said, what are you preaching on? Because I'm always ready a fortnight before. I said, what are you ready about? She said, I'm going to preach on the Olympics. And I thought, oh, man, George, you missed it. You should be preaching on the Olympics. So I have developed a sermon and it ends up in two. So I'm going to spend three minutes this morning summarising the first one so we get a benefit from the second one. The first one I preached about the Olympics was run for your very life. And of course, we read Paul's reference to the Olympics in the book of Hebrews. No question he was talking about the Olympics. Okay, he lived in the atmosphere. It was going on in his day. But when I got to read those verses, I thought, he's talking about the race, specifically back in chapter 10 of Hebrews. Turn in your Bibles to, uh, to chapter 10 
of Hebrews, and you'll notice here he's talking about the human race and what we run for. And in chapter 11, in chapter 10 and verse 38, he says, but my righteous one will live by faith. It's the run of faith. It's the run for eternal life. That's the gold. And the gold is eternal life. When we finally achieve gold, when Jesus comes. And verse 39, he says, But we are not of those who shrink back, boys and girls. Write that one down. We don't look back, right? But we're of those who believe and are saved. Hmm. We are those who are being saved. One of the translations I have, and I didn't bring it with me, it was too heavy, and I think the last time I saw it here, um, Jan New had it, the New Living Bible. And it says, to the saving of your souls. That's the gold. Yeah, to the saving of your souls. Don't look back. Press on by faith. Now, what is this faith? 11.1, one, he says, now faith is the substance. Now, the, uh, in the King James, uh, in the one I have here this morning, it says, faith is being sure of what you hope. It's better than that. That's weak. It's all weak. The King James men didn't have a clue what the Greek word herpostasis meant. None of the Greek scholars did, not even Erasmus. Until a few years ago, the archaeologists dug up a little old hotel that was burnt to the ground possibly the one where the Good Samaritan took his uh, friend to be cared for. And they were digging down through the ashes and they found a little metal box and they prized the metal box open and inside was a legal document. And it was the title deeds to the land. And a woman owned that hotel and the land. And the word across the top was, guess what? Hupostasis, the title deeds. The rights to the land. Jesus Christ gives us faith and it is our rights to eternal life. That's radical. That's radical. You can't save yourself. Paul just said to the saving of your soul, but it's not of self. It's that you have the rights and you have the title deeds. Jesus died and he's given you a legal document, faith, to be in the kingdom and to win gold. Wow. And you'll notice in verse 2 it said it says in one translation, the elders, the ancients it says here, the elders, they had a good report and it says were approved by God. God the Father approves you if you hang on to your rights and your title deeds. He has no option but to approve you because Jesus sanctioned it and sanctifies you. It's interesting about the runners in chapter 11. None of the previous runners in this human race ever won gold. No one's ever won gold except Jesus Christ. It's the only one that's ever won gold. You say, oh, what about Moses and Elijah and Enoch? Yeah, Enoch's won gold, he's there. Moses won gold, uh, he was carried there. Elijah's got gold, he was taken in a taxi. But it wasn't their gold. It was faith and their rights in he who won the gold for them. And he shared the gold. But you and I are still here. And like all the others in the Old Testament, we haven't won. You look at verse 13. It says this in 11.13. All these people were still living by faith when they died. So they had the title deeds when they died. But they did not receive the things that were promised. But they saw them. In the distance, they never won. They didn't win, but they died with the title deeds. They don't have the eternal life yet. And you and I are the same. And he he, he presses that point in verse 39. He said, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what they had been promised. They didn't get the gold yet. They have the promise of gold. Only Jesus has won gold. And what a wonderful God he is to have given them the rights. When you read the list of the kind of people they were, they had no hope of winning gold on their own as they ran. But he told them, Jesus, our coach, told us how to run. 
and Jim read it there, there to us in um, Jim read it there to us in chapter 12. We're to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And we're to put away the sin that holds us back and hinders us and look to Jesus. Look to the coach because he's one God. And we have the promise of gold. Now, boys and girls and mums and dads probably too, when I first presented that word from the Lord, I decided to put something on the, back, the blackboard that would help us to understand what Olympics, uh, Christian Olympics are about and what Pastor Paul was really talking about. I hope I can get this in here. I uh, C S. All right. Now, this is what it is. Are you writing it down? This is so you will remember what Pastor Paul is talking about in Hebrews because it's all about the human race. From chapter 1 to chapter 13 is about the human race. That Jesus Christ is the only one who's won gold and if you haven't got faith in him, you're done like a dinner. You'll never get gold. And by the way, there's no silver and there's no bronze. There's no seconds. There's only winners. No losers. Unless you choose to. All right, I put this down. I do my 5K every walk, uh, walking every morning around the Oval, a couple of Ks from home, and, and I said to the Lord, what can we do so we remember your word and the human race of faith and Olympics? What does it mean? All right, our life, let's put it down, our life yoke. Oh, I had trouble with this why as I walked around. I had it all sorted out, but I couldn't think of why. So I went home and looked up the dictionary and two words stood out, yoke and yardstick. Now, what's a yardstick? It's a measure, something that you measure by. All right, Jesus said, I'm what? The yoke, right? Take my yoke. Yeah, it's the best joke. And my burden's easy. What's the burden? Ellen says the burden, the heaviest burden you and I have to carry is the guilt of our past. And she said, until we give it to his yoke, it'll pull us back. Wow. Wow. Our life yoke made, listen to this, this is just what Ellen was saying, made perfect, right? In, oops, 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 in Christ's salvation. All right, so when you think of Olympics in four years' time, remember what Pastor George said. No, don't. Remember what, what uh, Pastor Paul said and what it means. Okay. Sermon number one. That's only the introduction. But as I walked around the field one morning... I'd, I'd just gotten out of the car because I drive the two and a half k's there. I will not walk along a road where the cars are because you only get bad air. So I go where the good air is, then I walk. And just before I got out of the car on the news, they said, tonight in Athens, the Paralympics commences. And I said, thank you, God. That's the sermon, Paralympics. Paralympics. What does Paralympics mean? What does para mean? Well, it comes from what? parallel, two parallel lines, it means close to, close to almost, well no I better not say that, it'll spoil, but they're parallel, they travel along together. Paralympics, they were called Paralympics because they're close to the other Olympics, they run along with it. And I got thinking about Paralympics and I watched a couple of them when I'd eat my breakfast of the morning and what wonderful people, disabled people. That's what Paralympics stands for. Disabled people. People who defy the odds to compete for gold. Imagine. And they came, came home with 100 medals to Australia. These people who have not allowed their unfortunate past and to hold them back. They take on a positive attitude. They're being trained by capable one-to-one coaches who understand their particular disability and they persevere and they exercise in their training. And in spite of their disability, in spite of what this world and life has thrown at them and plastered them with, arms chopped off, legs chopped off, all sorts of things, 
people who performed with amazing tenacity, real people who have real friends and real challenges. Well, I prepared my Paralympic message for God that he gave to me. And I said, but Lord, I need an illustration. And I'd worked every day and night since May had gone to the Cook Islands. And, you know, you get sometimes you just had enough. And by Friday morning, I woke up, went for my walk at five o'clock. And I said, I've had enough today. I'm going to take off. And there was a garden show down in the middle of the city in the, in the park and in the domain. And I said, I'll go down and go and have a look at the garden show because I love flowers, but it's mainly a place where all the rich try and sell you all the things they uh, want to sell you to get richer. But I saw some lovely things and I bought one little thing. But as I was waiting there to go in, I said, Lord, please give me an illustration for this sermon, for the Paralympics. And when I went in the gate, there was a nice young thing sitting there giving away free morning newspapers. And I was the first in the gate. And uh, I said, good morning, how are you today? She said, I'm fine. Uh, She said, would you like a newspaper? I said, that'd be wonderful, I never buy them. And that made a blink because she was there to encourage people to buy them. And I said, but thank you, I need that newspaper. So I went and I did my little bit and I was gone in three hours and I was back home in four and doing the rest of my preparation and stuff. But on the way on the train, I opened up to Sydney Morning Herald, right? And it was uh, the 24th of... September on page 38 and there was an article by a journalist Jessica Holleran about the cyclists, the disabled cyclists, the Australians at the Olympics. I'm going to take time to read it to you. Listen to it carefully. It's fabulous. And when I read it on the train I said thanks God. That's the illustration. An emotional Chris Scott sat under the Athens velodrome Uh, with his head in his hands before the team sprint final on Wednesday on bikes, cycles. Scott had already won gold in the individual pursuit. Notice the terminology? This girl had to be a Christian. Yes, he already won gold in the individual pursuit and he wanted to give someone else an opportunity to race. So he sacrificed his spot in the gold medal race. The Australian sprint team of Greg Ball and Peter Brooks and Peter Homan went on to defeat the US trio, meaning the Australians completed the track cycling program with eight gold medals, three silver and three bronze. And afterwards, Ball, Brooks and Homan paid tribute to Scott. They said, or Homan said, people wonder why we're number one in the world. Listen to what he says. We had four riders vying for three spots. Chris Scott had won gold earlier in the week. He stood down to let somebody else go in front of him who hadn't won gold on the podium. That's why he's Australia's Paralympic team captain. He makes the right decisions for us. Wow. And that's why we're so successful. We work as a team. Homan had won gold at Atlanta but not at Athens. Scott's time was 0.04 better than Homan's over the distance. But Scott wanted to give him a chance to do his best for gold at Athens because it was his last, the last time he was going to an Olympics, to a Paralympics. I decided I'd been up there and had the glory. I've been up there and had the glory I'm getting a medal anyway. So I thought he deserved to be up there. It's his last Paralympics, said Scott, who had cerebral palsy. It's lovely, isn't it? It's just beautiful. The love this man had for his team. Then they said, a lot of credit has to go to Chris Scott. He's a true friend and we love him dearly. You and I are in the Christian Paralympics We're not Olympians. Only Jesus won the true Olympian Christian race. You can't. You're a para-Olympic. We are saddled and disabled with sin that Adam gave to us. We are so uh, sinful and so para-Olympic Christian 
that our very genes are tainted with sin. We inherit tendencies to evil. Satan dished out to us sin and suffering and we're disabled of their habits. We're disabled competitors. But remember this, Jesus is our coach and he's going to get us gold. He's already done it. He stood aside and he's going to let us get gold. He's going to give us competitive skills so that we can succeed as good Christians and honourable citizens here and achieve goodness and honesty and courtesy to compete with each other. Now let's have a look at us. Just a brief one. And maybe I won't read them all, but we'll just, just take a look at us and then look at our coach in this Paralympic Christian race. Because we're disabled. And boys and girls, you'll find the older you get, sometimes we look back and we trip and fall because we're disabled. In Romans 3, 10 and 12, Pastor Paul is quoting. Turn in your Bibles and I want you to use your Bibles today. Because God's word's better than mine. Look what it says here in 3.10. And remember, Paul is challenging the Jews. He says, what advantage do you Jews have? He said, every advantage. You've got the word. You've got everything. But you're not doing it right. You're no better than the wicked and the, and the Gentiles. And he says here in verse 10, because I want to tell you it's written. And he's quoting the Old Testament. There is, there is no one righteous, not even one. You're all disabled with sin. That's what he's saying. He's talking to God's people. He's not talking to the Gentiles. He said, there's no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. And they weren't. They strung him up on Calvary. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. And there is no one who does good, not one. All para-Olympians, tainted with sin. What does he say in verse 23? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I love the New English, the New Living Translation. And if you want to read something for enjoyment in modern language, read it. But if you want doctrine, go to your King James. That's what I do. But lots of the others are helpful to hear a different man's view on what a word says. But this translation says we come short of God's glorious standard. So Paul's reminding us that on our own, as disabled people and disabled Christians, we cannot meet the commandments. We cannot match the law without our coach, Jesus Christ. It's impossible. We're para. We're disabled. And as Jerry Meyer said, what did he say? Well, the Ethiopian can't change his skin and the leopard can't change his spots. Neither you who are accustomed and born, may I be tempted to say it, born to do evil, be good. Wow. We're disabled. But let's not dwell on that because the Bible tells us in Acts 4.12 that we have a coach. In Acts 4.12 it talks about Jesus. Pastor Peter was talking about him. He said, you've strung him up on Calvary. You've, you've murdered him. He said, and this was your saviour. And he says down here in, in, in chapter 4, verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven to men by which we, what? Must be saved. Yeah. So without Jesus, there's no salvation. He's our coach. And uh, I love it in Romans 3 there, just before 24. I better go back there. In 3, 3, uh, 3, 24, he says this. We are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. He's our coach and he will give us gold. He has gold already. I love the translation in the New English Bible of, uh, of Hebrews 12. It says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd, and that's not just in the grandstand in the Olympics. That's not just in the district where you live. That's wherever you travel. People are watching. It's the whole universe is looking on. The whole universe is looking on. 
And we are witnessing to how well we run as disabled people. And he says there that, um, that we ought to uh, throw off, strip off every weight, especially the sin that so easily hinders us or hinders our progress. Jesus is our coach. He's the only one that's worthy to be our coach. And he can be the individual coach for each of us because he knows what each of us need as a particular skill to help us with our particular disability. Because not all of us, some of us have similar disabilities, sin in general, but some of us have disabilities that others don't have disability with. Some people have trouble with lying. Other people have trouble with stealing, stealing other people's wives or husbands. Some people have trouble with flabbergabbing about their neighbour, even in the church. We're so disabled. Well, I don't know about you, but I am. But I'm glad I have Jesus as my coach. He qualifies. There's no other name. As Pastor Paul said in Colossians 1.27, it's Christ in you, the hope of what? Glory. The hope of gold. Glory is gold. He's the hope of gold. In John 14, 23, Jesus said, I will come down and live in you, and the Father and I will live in you and be with you. And there's one thing about our coach. He will never leave us. Go back to Joshua, because he's, he was Joshua's coach. He was Moses' coach. Let's go back to Joshua chapter 1. These are beautiful verses. And these meant a lot to me as I was walking around thinking about this para-sermon today. It's a para-sermon alongside the Olympic one. This is the para-Olympic Christian sermon from the Lord. Look what he says down here in Joshua chapter 1. He said, no, no one will be able to stand, verse 5, up against you all the days of your life. As I've been with Moses, so I will be with you, and I will what? Never leave, or what? Forsake you. Never. Never. What about the coaches today? Someone offers them another $150,000, and they forsake their team, and they go to another team. Much love in that, is there? Well, there is. Love for money. But this coach... Jesus, our captain, will not forsake us. And I saw that word forsake. And the new, the new uh, living Bible says, will not abandon. My memory's right. Will not abandon you. And I had a quick look down my concordance. And you do the same. Look up the word forsake. And it's very hard to find anywhere where it says God forsakes us. It's all about how man and woman forsakes God. And you know, I remember being told when I was a little boy, if you sin, Georgie Porgy, Jesus will leave you. It's garbage. Over and over and over again, God says, I will not forsake you. And one dear old saint challenged me last week at church. He said, she said, that's not right, George. He said, we've been taught all our life. When we sin, Jesus leaves us. I said, no, he doesn't. I said, you leave him. He never moves. And she said, example, And I'd prayed to God. I said, I'm going to ask this question. I want to be ready. And you know, the answer came straight from heaven. He said, George, the prodigal son, dad never left. And that prodigal son is about us and God the father and Jesus the son. Jesus never left. The son abandoned dad, took all the goodies. We forsake God. He'll never forsake us. And we're tempted to, we para-Christians. We're tempted to turn our back on God and we abandon him, but be assured. You read Deuteronomy 31 and 1 Samuel 12, he'll not forsake you. Do you know what Samuel said to Israel? He said, yep, you have sinned asking for a king. You definitely have sinned. And they said, oh, please pray for us. And you know what he said? You read the verses, we won't read today. He goes down in the chapter and he said, I will not sin by failing to pray for you ever. Wow, isn't that beautiful? He was acting saviour as the priest and leader of the people. I will never stop praying for you. If I do, I'll sin. And he said, I'm not going to sin by stopping to pray for you. And then he turned around and he said, forget your sin. Maybe I should read it. Go to 1 Samuel. 
Go to 1 Samuel 12. We won't read Deuteronomy, but we've got to read this. This is absolutely beautiful here, what Samuel is saying to his, to his people on behalf of God. 1 Samuel and, verse, and uh, chapter 12, uh, 22 and 3. Look what he says. It says in verse 19, we have, we have added to all our sins this evil of asking for a king. And Samuel says, don't be afraid. You've done all this evil. Yet do not turn away from the Lord. Don't turn back, boys and girls. Don't look behind. But serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn around. Do not turn away. They can, uh, and turn away from the idols. They can do you no good. All right, look at verse 24. For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people. He does not abandon. He does not forsake. He does not leave us. Even when we sin, we leave him. When we come back, he's still there. The prodigal's father was still there. He had never moved from heaven. Because in the story, the father was God. And the farm was heaven. And God's care. And God's grace. And God's love. And God's provision. God's family. Wow. And he says down here, against the Lord by... Uh, oh, that's right, he said here, Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you, and I will teach you the way that is good and right. But be sure to respect and fear and love the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart and consider the wonderful things he's done for you. Isn't that beautiful? And that's, that's the message for the para for the para-Christians, the disabled Christians in Israel. And it's the message for us today. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 12, 12 and 13. Because it's obvious that Pastor Paul uses the Olympics as a spiritual lesson. And he's talking, when I went back to my Bible, he's not talking about the fit Olympics where everyone's 100% physically. Hebrews 12, 10 through is talking about the disabled Christian Olympics. Look at verse 12. He's not talking about fit people. He said, therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. And he's talking about the spiritual, all right? He's not talking about the physical. He's talking about the spiritual. Read it. From here on, it's the spiritual. How you live eternal life. How you live gold while you're here. He said, therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled. What? But rather heal. In other words, he said, walk straight. Don't put yourself on rough ground where the devil will trip you. Don't look back. Live straight because everybody's looking at you and depending on you because you claim to be an Olympian. Wow. Beautiful stuff. And go to 14 and 15, make every effort. Yeah, you don't sit around, there's works in it. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. But you can't get it yourself and you can't get it by keeping the commandments and you can't get it by keeping Sabbath. But if he is sanctifying you, you will do it. If he's your coach, you will do it with his power and strength. Praise the Lord. As, as uh, Jude said, what did Jude say in 24? What did he say? He is able to keep me from falling. Thank you, Les. Because we're prone to fall. We're disabled. And it's easy to fall. And Satan knows how to trip us. And I want to tell you, the tripping doesn't stop till you die. You know, a priest asked, uh, 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 the priest asked the, sup the superior priest who was 85 once, he said, how do you get on with this sin? And he said, I don't know, you better ask somebody older than me. What was he saying? He wasn't being stupid. He was being a realist. He was really saying, I have to depend on God while I have what? Breath. While I have breath. And, and Jesus promised that power. In Matthew 28, 20, you know what it says. What did it say? He said, I'm with you until the end of what? The world. I'm with you till the end of the race, Lucy. Yeah, and when he comes, he's going to touch you and you're going to get up and dance and jump and you're going to fly through the pearly gates on your two sweet little feet. Yeah, 
You'll leave the wheelchair behind. Won't that be lovely? Beautiful. And spiritually, it's the same. Now, listen, the last thing I want to say today, let's go to Revelation uh, 3, 20 and 21, because Pastor John takes us right through, Pastor John takes us right through to the dais where you get gold, where you get gold. And it's beautiful. Let's read it. Jesus is going to be right there presenting the gold at the end of the race. And uh, he invites us to, be, to go there. He said, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and, and eat with him uh, and he'll eat with me. Now listen to this. To him who overcometh, and this really hit me the other day, the hypostasis comes in here, the legal rights. Listen. He who overcomes, I will give the right. You disabled Christians, George, and all of us have a right to gold. Not by what we do, but because of our faith in our, our captain, our coach. Wow. And he says, and listen, he goes on, he tells us what the prize will be. And you will sit with me on my dais, my throne. 49 times he talks about throne in Revelation because it's a message from the throne. We'll be on the victory dies by faith. And like the Old Testament in chapter 11 of Hebrews, we're not there yet. We've got the promise. We've got the legal document. We've got the rights. We've got the hypostasis. But we haven't got the final everlasting life time bid on it with a brand new body. And you know, every day I get older, I want that new body. I just can't wait to get my hands on the tree of life. You know, you wake up every morning with a different ache. The trouble is all the ones before haven't gone away. Listen, let's get back to Scott. Why I love this little illustration. Scott said, I've already won gold. And Jesus said, I've already won gold. Let me come in and sit with you and eat with you. I want you to have gold with me on my throne. I want someone else to win gold and I'll help you win it. Just let me come and live with you in your mind and in your body and help you overcome all your tendencies. And whenever you fall, I'll lift you up and set you on your way. I've sacrificed forever, says Scott. I sacrificed a gold forever so Homan could have gold. Jesus said, I sacrificed heaven forever took on humanity forever so you can have gold, eternal life. I stood down, says Scott. I came down. I've been up there and had glory. Jesus said, I've come down. I stood down. I left my glory behind and I've come down so you can have gold, you disabled humans. Isn't that beautiful? And uh, they said of Scott, he makes the right decisions. And Jesus made the right decision. He died to save us because he loves us. And let's remember this, the older I get, he didn't die primarily on Calvary to save us. We are a side issue. He died on Calvary to preserve the name of God and to preserve the universe and to make sure Satan did not dethrone the universe. That's why he died. And we just happen to benefit from it. And his love is to vindicate God. Read the Psalms and read Ellen. And uh, they worked as a team, it said. Scott and his, his friends, they worked as a team. Jesus works as a team. You've got to work as a team uh, in tandem, in tandem, parallel, parallel. I'm going to say something about those lines in a minute, boys and girls. All right. And, of course... Scott wanted to give his mate a chance and Jesus wants to give us a chance. And Scott said about him and he said he deserves, he deserves gold. I know what we've said in the past and I know it's still true, but let's look at the other side of it. Jesus loved so much, he looks at Jesus, at God the Father and he said, God, they believe in me. By faith they trust me, they love me. I've told them all you gave uh, me and they believe it. Now they deserve gold. Ah, that's powerful stuff. That's radical, but it's the gospel. He is a true friend, they said of Scott, and we love him dearly. 
And I want you to know he's my best friend and I can't love him enough. And when I fail, I weep. It hurts because I know I've hurt him. And Homan said, Scott deserves a lot of credit. A lot of credit. Jesus Christ deserves all the credit. There is not one whisker of a thing you or I can do to make ourselves holy or to fix up our disability. But in the power and strength of Jesus Christ and faith in the Holy Spirit, we can live above our disability and we can be, get it, like Jesus. And that means holy, H-O-L-Y. That's how David did it and he was a rascal. That's how Abraham did it and he was a liar. And that's how you and I can do it. Let's give Jesus the credit. But before we go, and let's look at our parallel lines. You've done your geometry or maybe they don't do it now. Parallel lines, two parallel lines were identical lines, equal distance apart all the way, going in the same direction. Okay. J for Jesus, Y for you. He gives us his glory. He gives us his holiness. So when the Father sees us, he sees identical, holy, parallel lines. Not a disabled George, not a disabled Jan, not a disabled Mary, not a disabled Liz, not a disabled May. He sees a holy child of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. That's righteousness by faith. Now, let, let's do a little something here and then we're going uh, for dinner. We don't have to go home. It's just around the corner, so don't worry. All right? Now, Y, M, P, I, C, S. Okay, now you've got that there. It's the same. All the way down there, it's the same. All right? But we've got to add up here. What do we have to add up here? Para. What are we going to do now? something that you can remember. I hope you're writing it down because when you go home you'll forget nearly everything I've said but don't forget the Bible we read and take these with you and don't forget these and think about them. How do we win the para-disabled Christian Olympics? We pray. What's the next word? Always. Always. Lovely. Always. My, you're bright people. Uh, Pray always. What have we been talking about today, boys and girls? Racing and what? Running. All right, so you can put racing or running here. I'll put running. You can put racing if you like because you've got to race to keep ahead of the devil. All right, racing to, what are we going to say now for the next day? Achieve. We have to achieve, all right, but not in our own strength. To achieve, right, and I put one word added here, his, what? We are to, uh, his... Where do I go here? Hang on. Yes, his love. Anyway, the rest of it's the same down there. I'll fix that up later. Okay? All right. Now, I hope you enjoyed Pastor Paul's message today because it's his, it's not mine, and Jesus, because that's what Paul saw when he saw the Olympics. Now, since I've been here, maybe someone's tripped. Maybe someone looked back. Maybe someone fell over. Maybe there's some boys and girls here who have never said, I'm going to make Jesus my goal to run for. All right? Boys and girls, and I'm thinking of all of you. Do you want Jesus to be your coach so you can run for gold and heaven? And Hebrews tells us we're running for the sanctuary. We're running for the throne room because that's where Jesus is. We're running for heaven, the better country. Do you want to run for heaven and the better country, boys and girls, in your life? Will you come out here and I want to say a prayer for you. So you come out here this morning and stand with me. I saw you nod, so you're done like a dinner now. Come out and hear and I'll pray for you. What about you, Luke? God bless you, Luke and Holly. Come on. That's all you boys and girls. That's right. Come out here and let's say a prayer for you so that you win this race. Because I'm very sorry. I apologize to you from all parents that you're disabled, you kids. That's wonderful. Yes, you can come up here and stand and face the people. That's good. That's lovely. And the little boys too. 
Isn't that lovely? What a growing family. <gasps> I'm jealous. My two churches, nearly all the kids are gone. Oh, isn't that lovely? Aren't you happy mums and dads? Grandpas and church family? Now, we haven't finished yet, though. We haven't finished yet. Because in this race, since I left here four years ago, maybe, now I don't know any secrets, but maybe someone's tripped over or looked back, you know, with your disability. And, and, and you want to come up here this morning and I'll say a prayer for you so that you can get up and run on with the coach. Is there anybody would like to come down and stand with us and the boys and girls? Lovely, I saw you sitting there. I haven't seen you for so long. Come up and stand next to me. That's lovely. Praise the Lord. Yeah, God bless you, Sue and Diane. God bless your brother. Who else is there? Right? Who stumbled? You don't have to be ashamed. This is the disabled race. And I tell you, none of those people was ashamed. God bless you, brother. You take a seat. That's good. Yeah, God bless you, Carol. Come on, sister. That's lovely. Isn't that lovely? Very good, because we all know we're in the race. Is there anybody else who wants to say sorry to Jesus and get up and run again? Someone who is tripped. All right. No one else. There must be one or two others. Yeah, God bless you, Liz. Stand where you are if you want to. Okay, thank you, Rod. Right. What about the rest of us? Do we want to acknowledge that we're para and that we need Jesus to be with us as we run through life and to help us so we don't fall again? God bless you all. Oh, it's lovely to see you all standing. Let's pray for you all. God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have been very straight in Scripture and explained to us that we're so sinful we can't save ourselves but that we can believe in Jesus and get gold. And Lord, our hearts are so happy today. Thank you for these lovely boys and girls who want to run with you and have you as their coach and who want to run for gold, eternal life. Help them to be very good for mum and dad. And Lord, bless the adults, those of us who have stood, to ask you to be our coach to forgive us for our mistakes and our failures and our falls and to set us on our way. And God, today we hang on to the words of Samuel where Samuel was telling his people not to be worried about the sin behind. It was no good looking back. It was no good looking back and dwelling on the sin but to look forward and to make sure that in the future we walk straight and live straight in the power of Jesus Christ. Help this to be the experience of each one of us, from little boys and girls to big boys and girls and young men. And oh, today, Lord, before we go, pour out a special blessing on Luke today because today, according to Scripture, he's a young man this very day, the day our girl was born that is now dead. But Lord, we live in the promise. And we live in the promise that you'll be with these little people and that you'll be with each soul here, Lord, who today has rededicated their lives to you. Thank you for being our coach. Please give us courage and help us to put away sin that holds us back. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Okay. And now, may the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit rest upon you all and go with you all and empower you to keep your promises to the one who never breaks his. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.